Thank you, Rahel, for such an emotionally touching uh, presentation. Uh, I would just, you know, I raised uh, some of the questions, but I would like also to give the opportunity for the other panelists to reflect on some of the issues that were raised. I think the Gaye gave us this uh, picture of, uh, you know, that uh, we are facing into disaster, but urbanization is the way out. And uh, Bethlehem, I know you have been uh, working on the master plan um, of Addis Ababa for some time, and you are, uh, you're seeing, I mean, in a way, you're, you, you're involved in the planning of the future of our city, and also in relation to the, to, to, to the country. So what, what do you say is uh, the, the really the main challenge in this mismatch of making master plans, plans, and realizing them? And then I go back to, I go to Mahder, Mahder who's uh, uh, not only an architect and a planner, but also a media person. He, he educates our public through his uh, radio program. So uh, I'm sure you have this encounter of, uh, of people, uh, you know, ordinary residents and what they think about urbanism and what we do, and also how this reflects in their, in their daily life and what do you think is, you know, what uh, Rahel raised as uh, the public participation, as what people think where their city is going, or do they have a say at all? Or do they, are they participating? Are they contributing? Or is there anyone listening to what they want to say, uh, what they want to tell us? If you, I think, uh, and then uh, Dieter, I think you would really, uh, you know, I, uh, I want to just throw questions to all of you because you'll probably get a bit of time to, to reflect, but please make it short. I'm making the questions. So, uh, Dieter, you raised the industrial park, uh, the uh, foreign direct investment, and so on. And then uh, Otto Derege raised the micro small enterprise. There is two differing views on how to develop urbanization. Foreign direct investment, industrial parks, and uh, industrialization, manufacturing industry, and then micro small enterprise as an alternative approach in cities which is more inclusive, which involves a lot of people, and so on. So please uh, reflect on this. Um, oops. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, LSE, for this opportunity, for myself, but also for the city. Uh, because it's really an eye-opener for most of us around here uh, to see uh, bits and pieces from all, o all over the world. But as one presenter yesterday said it, I mean, after all, the questions that we have as human beings are all the same wherever we go. I mean, we need to live, we need to work, we, we need to uh, play somewhere within the city, and uh, as uh, Fasil just said it, having worked on this, or being engaged in this production of the master plan of Addis Ababa for the last six years, and also being part of the 10 year one, earlier one uh, 10 years ago, I would say the plans are there. I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, being, uh, I'm not saying that the plans are perfect, but at least there is a plan that is already put in place for the city, which uh, takes in the, the issues that were raised since yesterday around here, trying to create a compact city. Uh, this doesn't have any expansion area, so we have to build, to build high. I take... Uh, I take into consideration the Paris person that said building high is not uh, always uh, having uh, densities. We can, uh, we can reach densities with uh, walk-up apartments wherever we need it, but we need to densify the city. There are some areas where the housing is so, is so uh, devastating, I don't know how to say. Yesterday, uh, the person from Mexico was saying housing is different from making houses. And uh, <coughs> yes, <clears throat> uh, it goes close to my heart and uh, I get <laughs> quite emotional talking about 
the city around uh, where I've lived for a long time. But seeing people uh, walking up nine floors with their 20 liter jerry cans, uh, since they don't have water or electricity, is not providing housing for people. So, uh, as I said, the focus through, uh, for mass transport is there, the shift to, uh, to bring in uh, pedestrian-oriented streets, uh, to give uh, people uh, the ability to walk, putting in the amenities on the streets, and uh, different facilities like public toilets that we don't have in the cities. It's something that we have put in the, in the plans. But when we come to the implementation, I would say there is a major um, disconnect. Uh, the lack of uh, continuity, uh, I'm sorry, I, I just, <laughs> I just can't um, be not emotional uh, talking about this, I think. But uh, the lack of continuity in the ideas that we put in, the shared vision for the long term, shared by all, by everyone, is something that we miss. Uh, each time that we make new reforms, that we change the political directions, it's, we start anew each time. So things are not going as flowing as, uh, as we uh, think it uh, through. So the lack of continuity, institutional setup, and uh, institutional memories are missing. Uh, the second thing that was raised also yesterday is this thing of understanding the context. Uh, nothing can be copy paste from uh, uh, other places. I mean, we need to understand the context. The thing that worked in some places around the world might work for us, but they might not be. So we need people to kind of decipher the, the details in that and see uh, where the, uh, the opportunities are, where the, uh, the solutions should be that fit to our context. Uh, this is the second thing that I would say. And the last point I want to uh, put in is the data issue that was raised uh, uh, earlier on with the transport issue. But data is needed. I mean, we plan on the land. And we, if we don't have a clear uh, land registry put in place, uh, if we don't move to a uh, an automation type of uh, system that can be uh, uh, easily uh, updated and easily available for everyone. Uh, I'm sure people miss that, uh, or a lot of you from other places, maybe you have a clean uh, land registry system put in place and you know who owns which land and uh, uh, parcels don't fit one on top of the others and this kind of things have to be clear. And these nitty-gritty things and the details have to be put in place before thinking of uh, the larger scale. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure you have put up uh, a lot of time to put in this uh, two days conference, to put up all these uh, uh, remarkable stages and even put maybe the figures outside there. When we talk about the population figure, if I ask somebody in this uh, room, how much people there is, I mean, how, what's the population of Hadis? Maybe I would say four million. Another person would say maybe five. Some would go even to 10 million. Somebody has to know, has, has to say the right figures, and this is the underground work. They're building the base of it. Thank you so much. I respect uh, some of the professionals who chose to stay in this very contested and uh, sometimes very difficult uh, environment to work in urban planning and related uh, uh, assignments by the government. I would start by the, who says how the urban agenda is set in Ethiopia and who sets the urban agenda? So starting from transformation of uh, the urban agenda and also how to plan it. That is the main question that we need to be asking, especially we want to transform the, to, to, trans, to transform the, Urbanization. I didn't get your message. You were trying to say something. So I will start with the context. The context of understanding the Ethiopian situation, starting from ideology, the Cold War, a country that was fortified for for so many years, uh, the questions of federalism that's not even 
Mahad, whole vineyard. Mahadar, I hope this is not going to be another lecture. So, because well. <laughs> I'm sorry, because I know you, you can say a lot about these things. Are you self-censoring me? <laughs> no, no, no. All I'm right. just uh, trying to be fair. And yeah. well, I'll use my time, but you took some seconds, so please count it. <laughs> So this, I'm not, I'm not here to lecture, even though you said on the radio I get educated by engaging with the public, which is a different uh, medium. So when I say we, to, we have to understand the context is from where we are as a snapshot uh, and uh, to, to solve our uh, bigger problems that we cannot deny. So it starts also from uh, governance in government that the learning curve takes a long time, that we, by the time that our, our leaders get educated about the subject, they get relocated. So it's a, a, a new start for uh, all of us. And there is a notion that the, the government or we are the people, we focus on the visible things than the preparation, like the land information. If you compare Gasabo with uh, Kigali and Kazan, she said, so it's a complete different thing. So if Christian was uh, here, he would have uh, said a different thing about this thing. So yesterday, Elias was saying that the Kavali houses were uh, cheaper and they were affordable to do, but why? Because they were nationalized, uh, from other citizens of the, the, the city. So it means there are lots of elephants in the room that we didn't uh, deal with, so they are like a herd. So these this things need to be discussed. The, so I would say the next challenge for Ethiopia would be, is, uh, as I see it, is because hoping that we'll solve our uh, federalistic and political and religious issues that are popping up left and right, but the educated and the uneducated, the, 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 the rural and the urban, and also the have and the have those are visible here, and we are seeing the the, the, we are testing it uh, in a very sour test. So I would say yesterday, Irene and Kate were ping-ponging. They were saying uh, that uh, China has an agenda for Africa and Africa should have uh, an agenda for uh, uh, China. But I would say we need, as Ethiopians and Africans, we need to have an agenda for all. Because in my lifetime, I'm a fairly young man, uh, and as you see, in my lifetime, I saw the Italians, the French, the Chinese, the Londoners, the Arup, the GTZ, all of them are the interests in the way that we deal with them is not controlled. So these are the things that we need to really be focused on. But coming up to, coming back to the planning transformation that I would say is the three things that an accountable commitment is very important for us. The government and we as a nation commit a lot, but we need to be accountable for our commitment. The second one is we have to have the finance and the power to do so. And the last one is to have a shared vision. Uh, this discussing the master plan has been an elephant in the room for Ethiopia, that it is there, many people oppose it, some people support it, but it's not being discussed. But at the end, we need to discuss what the alternative. Eventually, we have to discuss about this thing. So what are the mechanisms that we are going to put uh, to guide the urban transformation? Issues like ownership. Uh, uh, yesterday, Christian said the, the country decided, but the, the, the Belina said the government decided. So, who owns the city? Do the people that is own the city or the government owns the city? Who owns the infrastructure? Do I own the infrastructure or you own the infrastructure? So these are the things we need to discuss. But the biggest threat that I see is if we have to urbanize, like the Gaye was uh, eloquently was saying, we are going to deal with big issues, like three-fourths of the building infrastructure components are imported. Can we sustain three-fourths of the important with a very minimum uh, manufacturing uh, capacity and also a very uh, sliding export? So we need to discuss with Dix where, where are we going to get the power? We need to plan for that too. Not, we cannot only plan for the urbanization, but to summarize it, we have not wet wood, but I, I call it the youth tsunami in Ethiopia that the mobile connectivity is something that's not being discussed here. Like with connectivity with, within 10 years, from 2 million we have reached to 65 million, believing the statistics of the government. So 65% mobile penetration, 18 million data users, all these are important figures we need to understand so we can plan it. Because in the 60s, when people were discussing, they have to come to Arat Kilo in Piazza to understand what the ideas were. But now instantly, somebody in Bardar is listening to what I'm saying about the urban agenda of Ethiopia. So this fast and efficient way of communication needs to be addressed carefully. So, so my, my thing will be is how do we transfer knowledge, including the knowledge that LSE is bringing? And the other one is can we understand the scale of the challenge, uh, starting from land management? And finally is rule of law. The rule of law needs to be uh, respected carefully. And to do that, 
the debates of urban debate should come out to the society. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are, uh, I'm sure this is enormous. There are incredible challenging questions and, and uh, issues. So we cannot, I think we have uh, also to give time to the, to the audience. We cannot resolve them here, but let's hear also some, let's get some questions from the audience. I think uh, we will start, uh, let's start with this, with the lady here. I will collect a couple of questions and then uh, depending on who uh, it, it is direct to, you will answer. Hello. Ah, thank you. My name is Etta Madete from Nairobi. I'm a practicing architect and a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. For me, it is just to make a comment on something that has been alluded to very briefly by Vera in the opening remarks, as well as Dieter and Patrick, which is that in Africa especially, the countryside and rural development is not, it's not necessarily a sector on its own called rural development. It is actually urbanizing and digitizing at a very rapid rate to the point where the weighthood of the youthful population is choosing in urban areas to move to the countryside. And the reason this is important for Africa is because we still have very important connections to our countryside. For example, you'll find that many of the Nairobi, Nairobi's urban population go to the countryside three times or four times a year to visit their families, their grandparents, and it's an important connection. And if you don't believe me, try visit Nairobi in the next month, between December 15th and December 28th. You'll experience something called urban to rural migration. You'll not experience any issues in the urban area. You'll, there'll be no traffic, there'll be no people, there'll be no cars. So perhaps we also need to consider that rural development is not a separate entity on its own. And if you look um, further, we are working with the University of Nairobi, the Guggenheim, and OMA, Rem Kulas, on a countryside research called Countryside Future of the World that is going to have an exhibition in the Guggenheim, New York um, in 2020, which is looking at countryside development all over the world, not as a separate entity, but as a solution to urbanization, which causes decentralization and devolution of economics, technology, finance, and people. Um, so I think it's something that needs to go onto the table. Thank you. Thank you. It's good that you raised this because Ethiopia also plans to build 8,000 rural towns. This is one of the plans. And uh, uh, yes, so who is the next? Uh, I'll give this is uh, two. Uh, when I give the numbers, uh, it's uh, number two. There, I have to take one of you. Choose which one. Okay, now it's three. Four. Hello, Matteo Robiglio from Politecnico of Torino, Italy. A question about typology. The, the African city has been a constant inspiration for uh, European and uh, North American planners and architects due to its incrementality and mixed used. And it seems that this path is uh, abandoned, especially in the typologies that you uh, apply that I see while going around the country and around Addis Ababa. The new development seems uh, monofunctional and inherently rigid in their typology. The housing typology that are built have lost the vibrant mixity of the traditional uh, Addis Ababa and traditional African cities. And maybe that there is a, a, a path uh, that could be pursued, uh, and it's a path uh, towards uh, an African uh, uh, way to, to the new city and to modernity. I, am, I still find inspiring the brief that uh, Haile Selassie had given to architect Mezzedimi and to the Varnero Enterprise in making the public buildings that made Addis Ababa the real capital of Africa in the 60s. And it was the idea of representing an alternative to European and North American international style. So maybe in other ways this could be an issue for making the new city. I'm Dawid Benti, a lecturer at uh, uh, EIABC, and I'm part of a consortium uh, of European and Ethiopian universities studying informality, informal housing, uh, that was funded by the European Union. And uh, while we were doing uh, uh, this study, there was hardly a document about informality in the master plan or on the on the structural plan. And uh, you know, these there is now for the past like uh, six or five months there is. Uh, an explosion more than you can imagine. I live at the edge of the city, and every day I can count like a dozen of houses coming up 
every night. You know, in the morning I see, oh, this new house. And these are genius people, you know. They, they have come, they have even started claiming like the, the very place that people can walk. And uh, it's, it's explosive, I mean, you cannot imagine. And these people, they know the process. And uh, this invasion or this uh, explosion of informality happens uh, when there is a kind of a turbulence at the top brass level. When a kind of, you know, government or governance changes. When there is a kind of political uh, activity, hot, heated political activity, then they do it. And what they do is they're using their roof with, they're building their roof with an old rusted corrugated iron sheet. They thought that when the aerial photograph is taken from the top, it will look old. And that would give them a kind of, you know, security because they, they, <laughs> They would think that, I ask them, that's why they, they, they will tell you that uh, if, uh, you know, aerial picture is taken, it looks old. Then that gives them a security. And there is no discussion from, I would like to ask uh, to the Reg, uh, from the plan commission, there is no discussion of informality. I mean, it's explosive. All the rivers are, especially if you go to the fringes, there is hardly a place to throw a stone. So nobody is discussing it. Not a strategic plan. So there we hardly found anybody from the government. There is only one course at the Civil Service University who teaches informality. Only one course in the nation. Thank you very much. Um, Lagos, and we Nigerians, we Nigerians generally were famously chaotic, um, and uh, chaos is our gift to the world. Um, so you're all welcome. I'm saying this not so, in not so much jest as to say, if a lot of you Addis Ababans and Ethiopians would just visit Lagos, come and see me for a week. You will come back, all your tears will be wiped away. You will, you will realize that you are still so way ahead. On a more serious note, I've been thinking about the, the resilience strategy for Lagos. And what comes to mind is that looking at it and just looking through the chaos and seeing the order, seeing the natural order that emerges through informality and through people's everyday decisions, I realize that the real strength of Lagos and I'm sure this goes for Addis Ababa, goes back to social capital. It goes back to people, it goes back to culture, it goes back to history. And I'm not saying that in a, in a schmaltzy, sentimental way. I mean that when, when the state is missing, when the state is missing in action, people go back to something inside them. And I think what you can do is to keep that something alive in the first place. Don't lose it, don't let it go. Ethiopians are very disciplined people. Okay, extremely disciplined people. I've just, I walk down, I walk from, uh, walk down the streets here. I've watched just for a couple of days, but I can see and I, can, I know from your history, but you have a strong history of socialism and strong state, state control. What that gave you was a strong sense of order. And you, you, you know, you mustn't lose that order. That order is important. Now that order is going, to have to, is going to be challenged and you must get used to the idea of it being challenged. And the only way you can do that is by having these conversations. I know it's tedious. It's tedious and it's painful, and, and, but it's, I'm so excited because, you know, to see a, a, a minister of government being challenged by a, a media person, this hardly happens in Nigeria, okay? This is wonderful. This is good. Uh, a little bit painful, but honestly, this, I think this is the way forward. And if, and if Ethiopians and Addis Ababans hold on to that core, and what you must do, and I, you know, sorry, I'm rounding up one minute. You know, one of the, the, the books that has influenced me the most recently is by Yuan Yuan Ang. How China Escaped the Poverty Trap, and it's, 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 it's essential reading. And she gives some insight into what China did. And essentially what China did in 1978 is that they gave themselves permission to challenge the rules. Okay? Because the rules said that if you were communist, you, were, you, you, you didn't, in, 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 you know, if you were communist politically, you had to go be communist economically. And China gave themselves permission to say, no, we will stay communist politically, but we will embrace capitalism. And they made it work for themselves. They broke the rules and they wrote their own rules. And I think Africans and Ethiopians, all of us, must give ourselves permission to write new rules. It's very important because... <laughs> 10 seconds. Because the people who wrote the rules that run the world did not consult us. And so we reserve the right to write new rules. Thank you. Thank to say something about the master plan implementation. Why we are not successful very much in our master plan implementation, though 
Addis Ababa is undergoing very rapid urbanization. It is common that some of the challenges of urbanization are uh, we are encountering and we are facing them. And when we um, refer back to why we are not successful in fully implementing the master plan, one of the main reasons is there are some gaps in the preparation of the master plan. Where the gap lies in encouraging individuals in different walk of life to participate. Because in the master plan, what we are going to do is we are going to plan their vision, the vision of the country, the imagination of the people. And I also believe that more participation and the engagement of the people has to be there in the master plan because the master plan is for the people and the contribution of the people has to be also uh, immense. And I believe that we are not late because many parts of Addis Ababa will be built during our lifetime. And if we are going to have a shared values, a shared vision, where we are going to collaborate nationally, locally, and internationally, we will be more synergetic. We need new insight. We need new energy, new knowledge, new skill, and new attitude. Because we are going to build and we are going to rebuild a very historic city where heritage is at the center because we want to see the architect contribution of our grandfather. We can see yesterday through this heritage and the, the heritage are um, the results of the best mind of our grandfathers and it has to be at the front of our development. And recently, you see, if you know more about Ethiopia, some one years back, surviving as a country, surviving as a city by itself is one thing. Now we are in a position where citizens' participation at different level. At the city level, the city government is strongly working <coughs> and discussing with the youth, those who are making the landscape of the politics, the landscape of the social transformation, and the landscape of economic transformation that we are going to bring. And we can boost the social and the economic transformation because we are discussing with the youth, with the elders, with the scholars, and with different institutions, universities, and the research institutions because we need new energy. We cannot bring different things with doing the same thing. That's why we open our doors, we open our hearts to the globe so that a problem somewhere is a problem everywhere. And the Addis is in a very rapid urbanization and a lot of opportunities. Addis is not only at the heart of Addis Ababians. It is also the core of the social and the economic transformation of the country. One issue that has been raised, the issue of informality. It is obvious that it's common that. My office also undertook the issue of informal settlements. And we identified and we are working on with the stakeholders how to address the issue of this informality. When the political tension is there, top there, the informalities are there. And we are strategically identifying what is the cause of that informality and how we can systematically address the issue of this informality. Uh, that's what we are uh, working on. And uh, once upon, I will call all scholars from different parts of the world, from different parts of Ethiopia, that we have a good vision, a good political commitment, leadership to make this historic country to have a very historic city where one can have a decent life, a good place to live, a good place to work, and a good place to enjoy, and the emotions that our scholars here and different individuals has brought is an additional energy that in any of the development activities that we are going to undertake, we have to consult you. You have to be part and parcel of the development because the development is for the people and by the people. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, it's very encouraging to hear you speak and uh, I think this is probably part of the reform. <laughs> Thank you.
What did I say? <laughs> yeah, when we talk about, uh, about the plan, of course, the, we have plans on paper, but uh, there is no any discipline to, to implement them or to, to realize them practically. So the, this, the lack of discipline starts from the, from the government itself, and uh, the awareness of the people also very, very less. But nowadays, the plan issue becomes, I think, uh, a big issue. Uh, professional plans are right now, they are, they are politicized. By the way, it becomes a uh, hot political agenda in Ethiopia. Nobody can, can't talk about uh, national plan, about regional plan. So plans lead us to, to conflicts everywhere, everywhere in the country. So um, I think professionals in this sector, you have a big assignment. There is no any relation between politics and, uh, and plan. Just plan is a development of, uh, of uh, urbanization. But you remember uh, the conflict uh, happened before some years back. And even now, if you go to Parliament or if you go to House of Federation, <laughs> nobody wants to listen about, uh, about urban planning, about regional plan, about uh, as a national plan. So uh, I think we have, uh, both of us, we have assignment to clear the minds of uh, policymakers and the mind of a population that uh, planning is nothing to do with, uh, with politics and with, uh, with regional uh, responsibilities. So uh, this is the first point I want to, to mention. And the other is about informal settlement. Uh, spe especially nowadays, the informal settlement, as, uh, um, as uh, one person mentioned it, it is, it's massively increasing in, uh, in uh, cities, especially in Addis Ababa. So there is, there is nobody to protect the land. Nobody to protect, protect the land. So uh, this will lead us to, an, to another security issue. Uh, so the cities should give attention to protect the land and to at least to manage uh, the informal settlements. <coughs> Saying this, uh, there are many, many issues many paradoxes raised in this, in this uh, panel discussion, and it is difficult to, to give some answer, just uh, uh, the brainstorming is very important. Thank you. Yeah. The, the question is really uh, addressed to His Excellency, the Minister. I wonder how you envisage a fair competition between the private sector and the public domain when, it, uh, when you talk about housing. The minute you, as a government, start competing with the private sector on social housing, for example, the private sector immediately runs away from social housing and concentrates on upscale units. And uh, I have seen this in many countries where the government is in such a hurry to add units as the population demands it. But uh, my advice to you, based on my 30 years experience in this domain, is to really just give the terms and the conditions for the social housing to be built by the private sector and don't get into that because you scare them away. If you scare them away, you will lose a lot of potential resources. And the way to make sure that you don't have abuse is to give them so much land that they have too much to lose if they start abusing what they have and don't give them too much time so that they don't sell expensively, but rather are forced to sell very quickly to get to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. But if you start by offering on the market to the poor people heavily subsidized units, you will run out of money very soon. You make them look like they are crooks because they are trying to sell the same unit much more expensively, and the simple man will not understand why he should pay so much more to the private sector, except that the private sector is trying to make a lot of uh, profit. So it disrupts the whole mobilization of the private sector in what you want, which is to add millions and millions of social housing units to the public. Uh, you were saying urbanization is not related with politics. I could, uh, it will be possible, if it's possible, you can explain it a little bit more for me, because 
uh, as my understanding, planning for urbanization was the main cause for the change of the political establishment just recently. So if you could just elaborate it a little bit. And for the other thinkers, especially for Rahil and maybe Fasil, uh, I would like to understand your narrative of history, like when I was your student also, you uh, define the cultural heritage of Addis, specifically in the era of this colonial or the Italian occupation. So would it be possible uh, would, would it be possible if you, uh, if there could be a new thinking of uh, having a, an understanding of uh, history of Addis, maybe 100 or 150 years before the Italian occupation, and then uh, you could be maybe using it for the planning process also. So this was a very uh, heated but very interesting discussion. You, you have, I think, unfortunately, we have uh, to close it. I would uh, really uh, encourage you all to come to the panelists and uh, ask them these questions. But I think we need to understand that at the beginning, the guy was saying, we have huge challenges. We are very ambitious. We don't have time. We have to find the way to it. Exactly the country and its challenges, do, we do not have time. And in this panel, we don't have time now to continue. So let's have the discussion at lunch. And because they, they are endless, I mean, we can open this for the next two days and it will never end. So please have the conversation during lunch for our honored, uh, respected uh, panelists and so on. Leave the floor to uh, Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fazil. So we have now a 45 minute break. Be back here in the room, please, by 2.30. And I'd like to thank the panelists, the presenters for this great session on Ethiopia.